All right, so today's teaching is called The Seed of a Woman, The Promise of Life. So now if you follow a seed, because there is a mention of a seed several times in the Bible, but they're not different seeds. There's this seed which God talks about in the beginning where he says, of like seed, you'll produce like seed. That's, that's not what we're talking about. The seed, which has three aspects in the Old Testament, is Jesus. So the three times a seed is mentioned, which the seed is only one seed and it's Jesus, is the seed of a woman, which is the promise of life, which is salvation and redemption, the destruction of the serpent. The next time we hear the seed is the seed of Abraham. That is the promise of the spirit, sonship. It brings in the blessing of God, which is the spirit. And then the third mention of the seed, which was promised, this is the promised seed, is the seed of David, which is the promise of the coming kingdom through resurrection and the building of the house of God. So we have one seed with three expressions. And we find this through the Bible. We saw it with the ark in Noah's the flood in Noah's Ark, where it had it was mentioned three times in the New Testament, it had three aspects, salvation, sanctification, and redemption, the glorification of the body at the Lord's second coming. Now we're looking at the seed, three different aspects. And then we also have one God who has three different expressions. This is a pattern through the Bible. And it and as we talked about in last lesson, that the Old Testament was written as an example for us in its pictures and patterns of spiritual truths that are revealed in the New Testament. So the spiritual truths and the, and the, the Son of God, which is Jesus Christ, who came and who was and did and died and rose again, he is revealed in the Old Testament with pictures and patterns. And when you put the two together, we have a, a complete understanding because you cannot fully understand the New Testament without the Old Testament, and you can't fully understand the Old Testament without the New Testament. We need them both because they are one person, and it's Jesus. So in Genesis 3.15, is the beginning of the first mention of the seed and it was the first prophesied promise and the first preaching of the gospel. So just a backstory, there are two trees in the garden and God said that he, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said you can eat from any tree of the garden but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil lest you surely die. Well the serpent came and tricked Eve and deceived her into taking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil instead of the tree of life. So the tree of life is representation of Jesus in the kingdom of God and his glory. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a representation of Satan and the system of the world. Because man was created to know God. He wasn't created to know good and evil because God is pure. He is life. There is no variations with him. The knowledge of good and evil, even though it's good, it's still rooted in death because it's not rooted in God. So what happened is because Adam had received the commandment from God and he is the husband, which Eve is under the husband. But when Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then her husband partook of it, she usurped the authority and headship of the husband, which is a picture of Christ, who is the head, and we, the body, the bride. So that's a picture of how the order of, 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 of authority of a husband and wife, because it's a picture of Christ and the church, which we are. 
us who are in Christ. So order was taken. So the sin still came through Adam because he was the head. So now at Genesis 3.15, because once they ate, they hid, and then God came and he, and he said, Adam, where are you? And he said, we were afraid because we were naked. He said, who told you you were naked? So Genesis 3.15, this is God speaking, and he's talking to the serpent, and he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, when he said, and between your seed, which is a little s, and her seed, which is a big s, this is the first time the gospel was preached. It was preached to Satan. It was the destruction of Satan. And Jesus came not only to redeem us from our sins, but to destroy the works of the devil, according to 1 John. So Adam, now let's go on. I'm going to come right back to this. So in Genesis 3, 17 and 19, then God turns to Adam and he says, then to Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Wait. Yep. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now God just proclaimed a curse, and this is the first time death is mentioned in the Bible because of sin and in Romans we read that sin reigns in death meaning if death to reign means you have a kingdom death is the dominion it's the the land it's the the kingdom the kingdom of darkness and sin reigns in death and man was put into the curse under the slavery sold under sin and that is why Jesus had to come to redeem us from the curse and to bring us out of enslavement as Moses brought the Israelites out of Egypt. So now, this is very interesting. So these are the proclamations of God the Father. He made to Satan and to Adam. Then in 323, Right after that, and Adam said, this is his response, this is now, no, then Adam said, where'd it go, where'd it go, in 320, the very next verse, and Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. So we need to take a look at this. So God the Father proclaimed the gospel, he preached the gospel to Satan, prophesied the promised seed, which would come of a woman. And then he turned to Adam, cursed the ground, and from the sweat of your brow, you will have to toil for your food. And dust you, dust you are, into dust you will return. Then Adam looks at his wife and says, your name's Eve, the mother of all living. Now, if you go back now if you go back to Genesis 2:23 a chapter before when woman was created out of man Adam it says and Adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man now a chapter later after the father proclaimed the, pro the gospel, the curse, and returning the dust to Adam, he turned to his wife and said, not, this is woman, 
But he said, this is Eve, the mother of all living. Her name changed. Why? Because Adam heard the gospel preached in 315 when God said, of your seed when he said in 315 and I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel Adam heard the gospel believed received a living hope and named his wife Eve mother of the living not mother of the curse not mother of death but mother of the living. Why? Because he heard the gospel and be believed in it. It's powerful. So this is the first time we are really the, the concept. If you go to first Peter one, three, Peter says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The living hope was the prophesied name of Eve, the mother of the living, because no one was living until Christ came. Because before Christ, we were under death, under a curse, we were a living soul, but we were dead. And when Christ came and died and rose from the grave, and when we believe in his name through faith, his spirit comes into us, we receive the incorruptible seed and we become life, life living in the spirit. Why? Because we receive the eternal life of God into us and we receive eternal life into our spirit and we are living because we cannot be deceived. Life is not life if it can be overcome by death. Only life is life if it remains life. If it's overcome by death, it ceases to be life. There is only one true life, and that is the life that is in Christ that we receive into our spirit the moment we believe. And it's the incorruptible seed of God, the word of God that has power to save our souls. And as through sanctification, he grows and is formed in our soul into the full stature of the perfect man of Christ. That's sanctification. Because we have to understand the first mentioning of the gospel isn't related to justification, which to be made right with God is justification. Read Romans. And through being justified by faith, faith we are made right with God our sins are forgiven that's not the first thing that was preached by God himself the first thing that was preached was what the destruction of Satan through whom all curse through whom sin comes because if you read in Genesis if you read when God spoke to Abel he warns him he said sin crouches at the door is sin a living person? No, it's a nature. It's the very personification of Satan. For when man fell, when Adam fell, he instead of taking life into his spirit by the tree of life, he took sin and death into his flesh, the corrupted part of the body, which is the carnal man, which Paul talks about in Romans 5. And when he took him into the flesh, we are not living by a, so, a holy nature, which was God's original purpose and plan, but we are living by a, an evil nature, the wickedness. It's the personality of Satan, the very nature of the beast, the very nature of the serpent becoming one with man in his soul, in his body. That's why in Psalm 53, I believe it's 53 or 51. It says, in my mother's womb, I was conceived in iniquity because through Adam, sin entered mankind. And because of one man sinned, all sinned. That's why through one man's righteous act, all are made righteous. Because the old man, the Adam is the old man. The second Adam is Christ. That's the new man. And we'll get into that. So first Peter one twenty three 
since having been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That is the definition of life. And it cannot come from the seed of a man. It must come from a seed of the woman. Why? Anything that comes from the seed of the man comes in, it comes corrupted. It's a corrupted seed, corrupted by sin, corrupted by death, corrupted by a curse. That's why when Jesus was conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit, he was born perfect lamb of God without sin, without blemish, because he was born of a woman, but not born under the seed of a man. That's why, because sin cannot atone for sin. Only what is pure and holy can atone for what is corrupted, what is death. That is why it says the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous. This is powerful. We have to understand this because these people, Adam and Eve, they are not far off distant people in some story. These are our ancestors. This is our heritage. But this is not our heritage if we believe in Christ. It's our earthly heritage, our natural heritage. But once we believe in Christ, we receive a new heritage and it's a spiritual heritage. Israel is our spiritual heritage. So the seed of a woman came to destroy Satan and to save believers from sin and death. Because Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, it says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him, who is Satan, who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, there's a scripture that says, to be made perfect in love. See, if we have fear, we are not made perfect in love because because to have fear is to have fear, is to have the fear of punishment and torment. And once we come to know the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we came to understand that he came to release us out of slavery from the bondage of sin, out of the slavery of fear of death. Why? Because sin, remember, reigns in death. But if we abide in Christ, we reign through grace unto righteousness in life everlasting. We reign in life everlasting by the one which is Jesus. And the only time, and it talks about to fear God, is to have the reverence and the awe. And the only fear we need to have is a fear of rebelling against God, the fear of sinning against God. There is only one true fear that exists in all the fabric of this time that we are on in this world, and that is the fear of punishment. The only person that can punish us is God. The only one who can bring destruction to man's soul and body and, and throw him into hell, which he does not do. God's desire is that no one perishes. But if we align ourselves with the devil and we reign in death by sin and we choose that, we are choosing death, which is hell. Do you understand that death is a separation from God? Death is everything that God isn't. So if we choose death, we are choosing to be separated from God. Death speaks to the flesh because it's the corrupted part of the body. We all want to live by the flesh because we live in a world that, 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 that is connected. We, we live in this world through this body, but we live by the spirit unto God and it grows in righteousness in the flesh is works of the flesh, which brings instant gratification, instant satisfaction, but it's deceiving. It is deceiving. The wages of sin is death. Even when we think, I'm just going to do this and then ask for Jesus' forgiveness and he'll forgive me. Yes, he will forgive you, but you still got to pay the, the due. You still, there is a cost. There's still a death. 
Yes, he can forgive you and you will be made right with God again. But we have to understand it does not come without a price. In our decision making, thinking that we can just do what we want and get scotch free without any repercussions because we'll, we'll just repent. Yes, we can repent, but there's still a cost. And some of those costs you will pay for the rest of your earthly life. It'll cost far more still than we can pay. It'll still put us into a section, a, a, a realm of slavery and bondage. And it takes a lot of work to come out of that because God is a righteous God and he is still a judge even as a savior. We have to understand that we are still going to be judged, if not in this time, in the time to come in the next world when we stand before Jesus we still need to give an account and we still give it account now if we think we got away from it here we will not get away from it there so Jesus he himself said in John 3 14 it says and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness now he's quoting in numbers here if you read the story the Israelites were complaining against God and the, 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 the they sent fiery serpents the serpents bit the Israelites poisoned them and they were dying and then God and then Moses and it's also a picture of intercession Moses went and prayed to God on behalf of the Israelites and God told them to make a serpent made of brass put it on a pole that whoever looked upon it they would receive life they would the, the, the serpents poison would be extracted from their body and they would live now you have to understand when the man fell Adam fell in the garden and he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the serpent's poison was entered into man as the sinful nature this is a picture this is a this is a very clear picture of salvation so and as Moses Jesus is saying lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. And then in John 12, and if you want to read that, that story in Numbers, it's, it's, verse, it's chapter 21, Numbers 21, verses 8 through 9. And that's what it said. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. This is what Jesus is referring back to. And then in John 12, 31 and 32, Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, even if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself now he's referring still back to numbers when he said he made the bronze fiery serpent and if the serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent he lived that is what he's referring to now we have to understand that the ruler of this world is satan man was he adam was charged in the garden to take dominion to subdue the earth god was charging man but first but because he can't do it by his own authority because man doesn't have authority God wanted him to eat from the tree of life to take the eternal life which is represented by Jesus into himself and by that life he would have authority to subdue the earth and this is a whole other teaching about what happened now that led up to this but we'll do that another time that have three weeks of this lesson but he fell and when he rebelled against God and aligned himself with Satan by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he gave his authority over to Satan now people are like I can't believe in God because how could God let all this stuff happening in the world how can he let babies get raped how can he let people die I'll tell you why because man was meant to 
take dominion, subdue the earth, and to multiply, to replenish. You know the meaning of blessing is to multiply? It also has another meaning, which means to sanctify. This world was made for man, and man was made for God. But man chose to serve Satan and handed over his authority and domain over to Satan. And Satan, through sin and death, is the one who oppresses, who influences, and has distorted the personality and nature and of man, which causes man to act in a way that is one with Satan and not in a way that is one with God, because God is holy. He is true. He is righteous. He is just. He is merciful. He is compassionate. He is peace. He is all these things that is the opposite of this world is. But it is through man's will, which is the most dangerous weapon in this earth, that he chooses again and again to serve Satan, even if he knows God. It's not God. So he said, he, so if we go back to Galatians 3.15, God said, now put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So he's talking about between Satan and the woman and between the children of the devil and the children of God, the seed of the devil. We are all, Jesus says, we are all children of the devil until we come to receive Jesus as our life. And only by receiving the Jesus as our life and our spirit do we become sons and daughters of God. And then we become, we receive the seed of Jesus is that seed we receive into us that he may grow in us that we may walk in him and him in us that we may walk according to his word not according to the world or according to our lusts but according to true righteousness and holiness and he which is Jesus shall bruise your head so Jesus will bruise the serpent's head, the serpent's head, and you, he's talking to the serpent, shall bruise his heel. Well, we know that as Jesus said, I have come to judge the prince of this world. And in 1 John, he came to destroy the works of the devil. He did that on the cross. But who put Jesus on the cross? It was the religious people. See, if we have operate in a spirit of religion, we're, we're operating in the spirit of an antichrist. There, you know, you walk in Jesus. You walk according to the spirit. You don't walk according to religion. So Satan, through religion, put him on the cross. So how did Satan bruise Jesus' heel? Well, if we go... To Psalm twenty-two, sixteen, it says, "For dogs have surrounded me." So this is David prophesying about the cross, unknown to him, and this is Jesus actually speaking within that prophecy. It says, "For dogs have surrounded me," as he's on the cross. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me; they pierced my hands and my feet. So how does Satan bruise the heel of Jesus? He drove a stake through it. He drove a stake through it. Jesus died an unimaginable death of torment and torture. Yeah, because he took upon himself the sins of the world as he hung up there. As the perfect lamb of God, he judged sin. And as he was raised up as the bronze serpent, he hung up there in the likeness of the serpent. Because when he hung up there in the likeness of sin, without sin, he judged sin. But when he hung up there in the likeness of the serpent, he judged the serpent. That's when the serpent was judged. See, if we are under the authority of Jesus and we're walking with him and not walking according to our flesh, our desires in sin, Satan can't touch us. He can try and oppress us. He can do, try and do this. We are going to suffer. There's going to be persecution and it comes in many different ways. But 
We are under the covering of God. And the only thing that can be done to us that is beyond what we can bear or that could lead us into sin, which is deceptive mindset, it is because we give that authority over to Satan. When Jesus hung on the cross, he died for our sins, he rose again, the veil was torn, and what? A way was made that God could come into us and we went into God. So you have to understand that when, when Adam fell and he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and not from the tree of life, God did what? After he proclaimed this to Satan and to Adam, he closed off the tree of life why lest man remain in this condition he didn't want him to eat of the tree of life and enter into eternity condemned so he closed off the tree of life and adam and eve were exiled out of the garden now we have to understand we we need to understand that the garden of eden is not Eden. See, Eden is a region and the garden is in the midst of Eden. So they were cast out of the garden. But when Jesus died and rose again, the access to the tree of life was opened again to man in the spirit realm. And in Revelation, when Jesus comes back at his second coming, then the access to the tree of life will be opened up to us in the natural. For the leaves will be healing for the nations. So when Jesus died on the cross and he rose again and his Holy Spirit, the very spirit of Jesus came into our spirit as life. That was the tree of life being opened up within us. So we are not under feeding upon the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is according to our own mind, our own understanding, our flesh and the world. But we can feed upon the tree of life, which is Jesus in our spirit through prayer and the word, because man came into God and, and, and God into man that we can walk with him and be with him and eat with him according to our spirit that's why we, we are to live according to the spirit how do we live according to the spirit to feed upon the tree of life in our spirit and not according to the flesh eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in our flesh that's why god says righteousness true righteousness is according to jesus not according to ourselves because if we are doing good according to ourselves and are a good person we we still dwell in death because even the fruit that was good on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the root systems were still death the only way we can have life and true righteousness which comes from Jesus Christ by the Spirit and it's not according to our efforts this is astounding and if you look at Genesis, which is the mention of the seed, and Revelation, which is the harvest of the seed in Genesis, you will see that God's intention when he created the when he when he created the Garden of Eden was for man and God to dwell together. And that was usurped, that was separated, that was stopped because of man's sin choosing to dwell with satan and so in the revelation he talks about the new heaven and the new earth coming down to the old heaven and the old earth will be done away with along with the sea and it'll come down and what is in the midst of the new earth is the city of Jerusalem which the Eden is a region the new earth is a region the garden of Eden is is the garden and the the city of Jerusalem is the is the garden it's the 
pure garden, what God meant for it, where God dwells with man and man dwells with God and they walk together and talk together and they know each other. That was what was his purpose in Eden. And but yet he did, you know, 2000 years from what happened in Eden, the fall, Adam came and he, or Abraham came and who became what? The father of faith through whom the seed of the blessing of the Holy Spirit would come where we would become sons and daughters not only of God but of Abraham because we are sons and daughters by faith and we'll get into that next week. And then, and then 2,000 years from there, which is 4,000 years from the garden, Jesus came, the promised seed. And we are 6,000 years out now. We don't know when he's coming back, but we need to live for him every day because we do not want to be left behind in this world because he's going to take his light from the world and we do not want to be in that darkness especially if we have the light in us, but we are choosing not to live according to that light, how dark will that darkness be? Oh man, how dark. So he was wounded, Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. His heel was bruised. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. This is on the cross. So Satan's ultimate end in Revelation is the devil will, be, will deceive them, but he will, in the ultimate end, there's, there's a lot of little steps that go to that, but he will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, because the sea will be no more, but there will be a lake of fire, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is Satan's end. So let's talk about the prophesied, prophesied, <laughs> the prophesied seed of a woman through what? Virgin birth. So the next time we talk about this seed, which God had preached to the serpent, is Isaiah came, a prophet. In Isaiah 7, 14, he says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in Matthew 1, 16, it says, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, Mary is a descendant of King David, who also the seed of David. So you have to understand the seed of a woman, and then the seed of Abraham, and then the seed of David, and then the seed was born of a virgin, which is the seed of a woman. That seed is the same seed as Jesus, but he passes through the Old Testament as a seed, giving pictures of the different aspects of what he is going to accomplish. It is incredible. It is so good. <laughs> okay. In Luke 1.32, it said, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. So now in Romans 1, 3, it says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Now, according to the flesh. See, Jesus came from Mary, not Joseph. Because if he came from a man, the seed of a man is corrupted. But he came born of God from a seed of a woman. So Matthew 120, I'm going to hit these all. 120, 21 through 23 and 25 says, But while he thought about these things, this is Joseph, because he was going to be betrothed to Mary, but then Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and he was going to put her away out of disgrace because no one believed her. But an angel showed up to Joseph, and it says, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, 
do that. Okay, this is another thing. So I'm really going to get into this in the, in the following lessons. But Joseph, son of David, and Mary is from the lineage of David. So this is why. Back then, Israelites, to keep their blood clean, they often married cousins. They kept their marriage within the family, within the tribe, to keep the bloodline clean. So Mary was from the lineage of David, but so was Joseph. But God, but God had to come through Mary because the seed of man is corrupted. Okay. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. So she remained a virgin till Jesus' birth. Now Paul confirmed this prophecy. The prophecy that was spoken in Isaiah 7.14, he confirmed it in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, when he said, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. Now, part of this is, 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 is part of like the seed of Abraham, but... So the fullness of time is the completion of the Old Testament time. We are no longer under the guardianship of the law, but under the sonship through Jesus. Now, what does that mean? So we were sold into slavery of sin by the devil when Adam fell and sinned. Law was given to expose sin that sin may become exceedingly sinful, that man would see the state that he was in, that he needed a savior, and he could do nothing of himself to be good or keep the law. So the law was given to expose sin, but it did not provide a way to keep it. Now, Paul talks about this in Romans 7, and we're going to cover 12 through 14, the verses. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal sold under sin so what does this mean the law was given that man would know that he is sin that he is committing sin that he is in sin but when we sin sin reigns in death so when we try to keep the law which is good and we don't and we sin death comes because sin reigns in death but he, if you, if you follow to the end of, of Romans 7, Paul says, what wretched man and I am, who will save me from this body of death? Thank God. Thank be to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who Jesus came to save us from the sin, that we could live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. That the law, so there is a law that is talked about in, in, in Romans 7, where I will to do good. But to do not good is present, but evil is present with me. There is a law when we, and it, it, it's rooted in the tree of life, when we make up our mind, I'm going to do good, but evil rises up. And we don't do what is good, but we do what is sinful because we are living according to the knowledge of good and evil. We're trying to do good while being rooted in death. That's why we need to turn to Jesus who is in our spirit. And, and it says to drink from the rivers of the rivers of the cup of salvation is to call upon the name of the Lord that we may be saved. Now, as I was talking before, we are justified 
made right with God is justification. But being saved, that's not salvation. Being saved, if you look it up in, 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 in the dictionary, it means to be delivered out of something. We are made right with God through what is done on the cross according to forgiveness of sins. But our salvation is happens in our soul and we are being delivered out of the old man, out of the soul that has been conformed to the world conform to the sin a whole life living in sin which has become our personality and it's not who we really are those desires those per, those preferences those ways are not us because Jesus is our real life and according to his spirit which is birthed and grown in us into our soul through sanctification that's why he says we need to deny ourselves to have life Life. We need to give up our life to have life. We need to give up our soul life to have the true life. And that means that we are not conformed to sin, to our past, to our experiences, to the world. But we are transformed by the renewing of our mind according to the word, which is pure and true. And it washes us clean. And we have to we see none of us want to step out of the comfort of the old man and step into the life, the true life, what is in the new man, because it requires us to die to ourselves and to live to God. And we no longer choose our old ways, but we choose the hard path. The narrow way, which is God, according to his true holiness and righteousness. And when Jesus says, be holy for your father is holy and be perfect for he is perfect. He is not telling us to do something that we cannot do. He is telling us something to that we have to do because we are doing it according to his life in our spirit. If we even dare to make him part of our soul through sanctification and dying to the desires and lusts of our flesh and our mind. The law is holy. It is holy, just and good, but we are sold under sin. We are carnal. So when Jesus came, so the law was given as a guardian in Galatians 3, 24 through 26, it says, therefore the law was our tutor. It was our tutor to bring us to Christ, to teach us that what we are doing is evil and what we need to do is good. But in order to do what is good and not evil, we need to do according to the spirit of Christ in our spirit, which was originally God's perfect plan when he told Adam, he placed him in front. It said he placed him in front of the tree of life. He was staring at it and he said, you can eat of every tree, but don't eat from that tree. So Adam, so they went like this and they're like, okay, I'm going to eat from that tree. That's what happened. So the Jesus came into our spirit and opened up the access to the tree of life in our spirit. So the tutor was to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith, made right with God. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Why? Because it says he was born of a woman, born under the law. So he was born under the law that he might save us, that he might fulfill the law, that we may be able to keep the law. How did he fulfill the law? Well, if you read through the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Numbers, it talks about sin. And, and, and the Israelites, the camp, when they were out in the wilderness, if they sin, what would happen? They would be separated from the people, be brought out of the camp, and stoned to death. What happened with Jesus? That was the, that was what happened in order to fulfill the law if you sinned. So what happened? Jesus went to the cross. He was separated from his people when they grave, when they grabbed him out of the garden of Gethsemane and they separated from his people and they brought him. They, they, they scourged him and then they made him carry his cross outside the city to Golgotha. And as he went outside the city, he was raised up and crucified crucified and he was he took upon himself the sin and curse of the world and he fulfilled the law that we don't have to 
He fulfilled the requirements of the law, which is death. So we didn't have to die for our sins, but we could, through Jesus Christ's death, be made right with God when we receive what he had done and received his forgiveness. That's what that talks about. So sin entered. It is through faith. It is through faith that we are sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. So sin entered mankind through Adam, being why Christ had to be born from a woman to be born without sin. Because Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. In Psalm 51.5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me, because it's seed of a man. So sin, and we already talked about this, can't atone for sin. Because 1 Peter 3.18, it said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. That's dying to the old man and living to the new man. We are crucified with him and we are resurrected with him. We are dead in the flesh, in the soul man, in the old man, that we may become alive with him in the spirit and living according to that spirit. So Romans 5.18, it said, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, right, resulting in justification of life. And after when I'm teaching, I get ahead of myself, and then when we go through my notes, we end up talking about the thing I already talked about, but I want to be thorough because we need to have and grasp the scripture. I want I want people to to grasp the scripture according to what I say, not grasp what I say according to the scripture. I, I want the scripture is what's going to impart life, not my words. So the last Adam, Christ, is the end of the first Adam, and all that he brought in, and the old man, which is Adam, is crucified. In the new man, which is Christ, is resurrection. Because 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and 47, it says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is, of the, is the Lord from heaven. Do you notice that there's no old man, then Tatiana, the new man. No, there's only old man and new man. There, we are irrelevant in, in, in the fabric of um, condemnation and, and, and salvation. We were created by a creator to worship God as, you know, as children and, and sons and daughters of God. But when Adam fell in the garden, he, 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 he gave all of his allegiance, his worship, his, his, um, servitude, his, his everything, devotion to Satan and the system, the satanic system of the world, the kingdom of darkness instead of the kingdom of light. So, so he was sold under sin. So we only serve one or the other. If we are serving ourselves and if we are worshiping ourselves, we, it's of Satan. It's, it's, there's really no us. There's either Satan or God. And who we are is based on who we choose to serve. There, there is, there is, we complicate it. We try and make everything about, we are done. We were done from the beginning. To even think that, there anything is about us is a deception even if you don't know Christ because it's only about Satan or God the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light and depending on who we serve and where we dwell through our actions not our words because we could be talking uh, like we're of Jesus but if we are actually serving Satan in our heart we are in this kingdom there's no you can't have one foot here, one foot here. If we think we have one foot in the kingdom of darkness and one foot in the kingdom of light, we actually have both feet in the kingdom of darkness. There is no serving two masters. That's in the Bible. You either love the one and hate the other. You know, he talks about that. You serve the one and despise the other. 
There is no us. We are servants. We are children. And our father is even the devil or it is God. There's no in between. To think that we are something, we are not. We are not. We are only whom we put ourselves under to live for. There is no way to live for ourselves. If we think we're living for ourselves, we're actually living for the devil. You live for Jesus. Because to live for God is, is a life of self-denial. It's a, it's a low road. It says the, the humble will be exalted. And the, and, and the prideful will be humbled. If we choose to exalt ourselves, we will be humble. There's no such thing to think that we can live for ourselves. It's, 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 a, it's a deception. We, we are in a bubble, this, this, this projected imagery that has been conditioned into our mind through a life in the world, which is under the prince of darkness. Romans 6, 5, it says, If we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Romans 6, 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And that's what we were just talking about. It's not Tatiana crucified to think that I'm being, well, actually it's the old man that needs to be crucified because we are still living in Adam. And if you read Romans and, and I did this, so like I go by the Bible line by line and I, I spent like a whole year in the book of Romans and I, and I barely like even just the smallest fraction of what could be extracted from that book. I was even able to touch. It is so deep. But if you look at, at, at Romans verse, if, if so, okay. For several months, I read Romans chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8 out loud every day. It'll only take about 15 minutes if you do it. And it changed everything for me. Because if you read Romans 5, it talks about being in Adam, the old man. If you read uh, uh, Romans 6, chapter 6, it talks about being in Christ, the new man. Now, if you read Romans chapter 7, it talks about the flesh, which is what is the experience of being in the old man. And if you read Romans chapter 8, it talks about being in the spirit, which is what is the experience of being in the new man. So Romans 5 and 7 are paired together. Romans uh, 6 and 8 are paired together. But you need to read those in order to have really an understanding of who we are and who we are meant to be. And I tell you, read it out loud. Even if it only, even if you have to do two chapters in the morning, two chapters at night, do it for 30 days at least. Out loud. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. And it's different when we hear ourselves read it. Our brain, it processes it differently. So Ephesians 1, 7, it said, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. From death to life upon believing in the gospel. That is the next part. So when Adam heard God talk to the serpent and declare and prophesy to him his own destruction from the seed of a woman, when he preached the gospel and Adam believed the words that God was saying in him was birthed a hope that was living. And he turned to his wife and he said, Eve, you are the mother of the living. The living is Christ because the seed that came out of the woman is Christ. So he wasn't talking about her next son. He was the, the living. He actually was prophesying without him knowing it, that he was prophesying the living being Christ. Because John 3, 36, it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, for the wrath of God abides on him. It is the Son is the seed, and the mother of the living was, would be that through her a seed would come 4,000 years later and enter into human mankind enter into mankind to what to save mankind from sin 
and to destroy the devil. So 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. So from death to life. So one of the things God proclaimed to Adam was from dust you came to dust you will return. So when Jesus came, he restored life. He, he, he squashed that and he restored life. We're still going to return to dust, but we will live forever with God if we have Jesus as our life. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through, 54 through 55, it says, So when this corruptible, which the seed of the man is corrupted, has put on incorruption, that means when we put on, when, our, when our, we are corrupt, the flesh will put, when we put on incorruption, when, when Jesus comes, we put on incorruption, that means we will receive glorified bodies. Just as Jesus had a glorified body when he rose from the dead, so will we. So when this corrupt, corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Hades is the grave, and we're not going to go there if we live by the life of Christ. Redeemed. So another part that came out of this is God also said to Adam, from the sweat of your brow, you will toil from the ground, you know. And, and so in Colossians 1.20, it, it talks about us being redeemed, the redeemed cursed ground, the earth and all that dwells upon and in the heavens. Well, what do I mean by this? Colossians 1.20, it says, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, talking about Jesus, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through the blood of his cross, he reconciled all things to himself, whether on earth or heaven. That means the earth, the nature, the ground, the animals, the people, all of it has been made right. And even now, the earth, it says that all creation, it groans waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. That's when Jesus comes and we step into the spiritual authority, the dominion, the kingdom of God and immortality puts, or mortality puts on immortality. That is when the whole earth will be redeemed from the curse and this world will be as what God created it to be with before Satan came and made his dominion of death upon it ruled by sin dealt with death now death is the last enemy so in Hebrews 2 9 it says but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. And the last enemy to be dealt with is death. We are to rule by the one in this life in order to rule with him in the next life. And we need to cry out to Jesus, whether we know him or not, as our salvation. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, come be the Lord of my, my heart, my life. We need to enter into the river that flows from the throne of God. When, when Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, it says, I will give you water that you will never thirst. Water that bubbles up into eternal life. The bubbling up is the Holy Spirit from our spirit. Jesus is the fountain that busted open in our spirit that we receive this water bubbling up and flowing out that we will never thirst. And it's the flow of the spirit. And it comes from our spirit because when we believe in Jesus, he is one with our spirit that we can live according to his life and not according to the life of our soul. We need to call upon his name. We need to repent. Repent. We need to forgive and we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to renounce all ungodliness. We need to um, um, sever from us the soul ties that are made through sin. And we need to rise up and walk according to the
the spirit according to the renewing of our mind we need to be in the word we need to be in prayer the word and prayer is our lifestyle now and we need to live by the spirit and that was the promise the seed of a woman the promise of life 